Hello and welcome to the 206 podcast where we talk about movies with the people who make them. My name is Mark Morin and I'm speaking with Dana Nachman, director of a wonderful holiday documentary called Dear Santa. Dana, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. Absolutely, thanks for being here. Now, Dear Santa follows the United States Postal Service's Operation Santa program over the course of a holiday season. The storytelling is a lot of fun and there's definitely some emotional moments as well. So first off, congratulations on the recent release. And for those that don't know, what is Operation Santa? Well, thank you for having me. Operation Santa is about, it's the more than 100 year old program of the United States Postal Service dealing with all the letters that get sent into Santa every year. So hundreds of thousands of letters get sent into Santa, Santa North Pole, uh, 123 Elf Road, all sorts of different addresses. And for more than 100 years, the USPS postal workers have been dealing with them in one way or another. And I learned about this via a book that was sold at the post office that my mom bought about eight years ago. And the book was so cute, but I thought, oh my God, this would be an amazing film. And every year I wanted to do it. And every year I didn't, I didn't have the guts to call USPS. And then finally I said, okay, I'm calling this year. And I called them December, 2018, and here we are. Excellent. Now, what was their response when you brought up the idea to them? Yeah, I was like, you know, these cold call emails, you never know what's going to happen with them. So somebody in the press office said, you know, this is a great idea. Let me just send it up the, the food chain a little bit here. And they did. And there was, um, you know, several calls, probably like six, seven, eight calls with more and more and more people on conference call. And then eventually they said yes, and they greenlit it. So I had full access to the program and full creative control of the film. And it was awesome. Did you also have to get Santa's approval for this documentary? Oh, yes, I did, of course. Um, so USPS has like a direct line to Santa. And so they confirmed with him first that it was okay. And then I did sort of an interview and he was a little suspect at first because I was Jewish and I, I never wrote him a letter. So he wasn't familiar with me. But then I told him about some of my Christmas experience and how much I love Christmas, even though I'm Jewish. And he really liked that because he thinks Christmas is for everybody, so, which I agree. No, that's great to hear. I'm, I'm glad he approved of your documentary. We had to show it to him in the summer. Huh? Really? Uh, yes. And so, you know, we thought it was a good time because he was probably like less stressed out. Um, so <laughs> right. To him and he, he loved it. So he was very excited. Excellent. Well, I can't see why he wouldn't love it. It's a great documentary. So I'm glad he did like it. Now, the opening of the documentary starts off with kind of an animated sequence that's in a post office, which is really fun and it kind of sets the tone for the whole movie. How did that come about? And tell me about the inner workings of that. Sure, yeah. So we start the film off uh, with a bunch of kids describing the world of Christmas. And we were deciding whether to actually have a kind of a fiction narrative version of it. And, and we had actually budgeted for that and everything. And then I was worried about depicting Santa and, you know, all the problems that could, that could arise from that. And then I thought, you know, why not have kids tell the story? Because, you know, that's what I think we all love about it, that about Christmas is that it brings us back to our childhood and how we felt as children. And so then, um, so we kind of had them tell the stories about how they interface with Santa, how they communicate with Santa. That's through the letters. The letters then get put into the system of the United States Postal Service. And then after we got through the kids, we went into this postal service warehouse in New York and we watched the letters go throughout the system. Oh, cool. And then our amazing um, graphics team animated um, part of that process. And it, it just, and it made it, you know, from I, I am very fast fascinated with the um, <laughs> the postal service like inner workings. I love looking. Mm. I love shooting that in there, and I love looking at the footage. But I think adding the playfulness of the animations tie it together with the kids at the beginning, also. Yeah. What was the process of choosing the letters and the kids and the families? How did that develop? Yeah, so it was an interesting process that we probably hadn't fully thought out beforehand because we didn't really have all the information. So one thing was we had to wait until the letters were written and sent into the USPS, right? So that all of those started happening usually like after Thanksgiving. So we were kind of twiddling our thumbs all through the beginning of November wanting to shoot and really didn't have any letters. So when the letters started coming in, then we realized that part of the deal with the USPS was they had a couple of... Um, like deal breakers for giving us access. And one of them was that we could never really have the access to the personal identifying information of the letter writers. So they had to redact all the letters before we got to, to look at them. So we did look at them, but we didn't know anything about the letter writers. Sometimes we would know their first names, but that was it. And if I was interested in them, 
they would then write a express mail letter that we kind of all came up with and sent an express mail to the parents of the letter writer saying, hey, your kid's um, letter has caught the attention of a filmmaker, Dana Nachman. Here's her email. Here's her phone number. Call her if you're interested in her process, I mean, her project. And so then we were just like waiting by the phone for people to call us and it was a little stressful. Um, And, you know, we had like some of our favorite letters were like, oh my God, if they don't write us, we're going to die. We're so, (laughs) we want them so badly. (laughs) So we're lucky we got a good handful of letters that people, you know, probably about, I mean, we probably had like 30 letters that people did respond to us for. And then we just wanted to pick and choose so that we had an array of the different kind of storylines because the letters all really are on this huge spectrum of, you know, very poignant, very emotional, funny, fun. And we wanted kind of a smattering of all of them. So then um, once they said yes, that's when we started booking our tickets, our plane tickets to fly everywhere and our hotels. And it, it was pretty hectic, the whole scenario, really. <laughs> Yeah, one thing that I really liked was there was a really wide variety of stories and kind of across the country, across demographics, all you know, pretty all over the place. It made it for some really, really interesting, fun, and you know, like we've mentioned, very emotional stories as well. Now, did you have much of an opportunity to get to know these families and these kids as you're making the, as you're working through the project? You know, I think I got to know the elves a lot more than I got to know the families, really, to be honest. I mean, I spent some time with them, but I wouldn't say I know them really, really well at all. I mean, but the elves are the ones that we really, so so once um, Santa got his elves and we focused on them, they we spent a lot of time with. And I mean, I was just on the phone with one of them right before I called called to you. Oh, nice. <laughs> so, like, yeah, so they're, um, so I'd say more on the elf side than the kid side. Now, one of the storylines that's kind of woven through comes out of the the wildfires in California. Is that something that just kind of came up through that process of back and forth with the letters? Or like, how did that develop? Because that was one of the more kind of emotionally hard hitting storylines in the, in the documentary. Yeah, that was a good insight. It did not follow the same trajectory as the letters. Um, so what happened was when um, in October, end of October last year, we um, had a kickoff meeting at the United States Postal Service headquarters in Washington where uh, myself and my producer Chelsea and I flew in for the day and we had this big long meeting about Operation Santa like around this huge table with all different people of the high ups at the USPS and one of the presentations to us was about their operations that they do around natural disasters so whether it's wildfires hurricanes really anything they have this like FEMA like um, operation where they go into shelters and they find the people, figure out what their address is, make sure they can get them their mail, which can be all their insurance documents, their prescriptions, all the stuff. So when there are natural disasters around Christmas, they also bring in letter writing kits for kids to write to Santa. So that was like mind blowing. I was very excited about that kind of storyline. And fortunately there were no wildfires or hurricanes or any disasters while we were shooting, which is great, but we still really wanted to get that storyline. So one of my PAs, actually researchers, started just calling around to places and she actually called into the Chico, which is right near Paradise, which was really affected, you know, just like basically 11 months before we were shooting 12 months before and they told us that they did this they had a lead elf and she uh collects the letters and that's how we found it so it was amazing wow so just a good timing good opportunity I and mean, like you were saying you never want a natural disaster to happen no. but it did create some uh, there was a lot of hope and joy that came out of that as well so that turns out to be a good thing ultimately Switching gears, let's talk about Dana Nachman, the documentary director, for a few moments. Now, from what I understand, you went from producing television to making documentaries. Tell me how that shift in your career took place. So yeah, I was a television producer for a long time. And in 2002, I got assigned a documentary by my boss. Um, I had been doing stories that were like 90 seconds up to like five minutes tops. And he said, hey, I'd like you to do a 60 minute piece. And I was like, ooh, that's that's full and hard, you know? (laughs) But I did it and I like fell in love with it. I mean, that was, it was so great to be able to tell, to sink your teeth into something so much more. And it really is a very similar process, you know, just bigger. So I fell in love with that and they ended up giving me two more to do at the station and then as I still worked at the station, um, I had done a series on um, a wrongful conviction in Bakersfield, California. And when the guy who was wrongfully convicted got out of prison, he, we were having a beer and he said, 
hey, you know, I was just one of many people that this happened to you. And I said, no, I had no idea. Uh, he's like, yeah, at the, same ha- at the hands of the same VA. And I was like, really? He's like, yeah, here, look this up uh, and do some research and you'll see. And so then I did this like totally crooked DA was putting people behind bars. It was like this wild west situation, a tough on crime guy. And that became my first independent documentary. Um, I did it. It was actually first going to be a book. This other reporter who had been covering the same case had won a, previously won a Pulitzer. And he and I were going to write a book together. And I was kind of his like his little apprentice doing some of the um, research and interviews. And then he got really busy. He worked for the LA Times and he got really busy and didn't really want to work on it as much anymore. And so then I was like, why am I writing a book? It doesn't interest me. Why don't I do a documentary? And so I grabbed <laughs> one of my colleagues at NBC, Don Hardy, and he and I made it into a documentary. And that was our first independent documentary. It went to the Toronto Film Festival and then got bought by... MSNBC films and that kind of launched my career in documentaries. Don and I worked together for, we did three films. I I think at one point like he quit NBC first and then I quit it after. We would do kind of both at the same time and then after a while there was just too much work. It was making the films, doing the journalism and also I had kids. I was like something has to give and the film isn't giving and the kids aren't giving so (laughs) so the TV station had to go and then yeah so that's how it started. Your previous work, as we're talking about it, it includes films like Bat Kid Begins and then Pick of the Litter, which was picked up by IFC Films straight out of the Sundance Film Festival. And then you were eventually asked to turn that into a limited series for Disney+. Plus. Like, Tell me about that year, year and a half window where that was taking place. Yeah, so um, actually it premiered at the Slam Dance Film Festival, which is like, which is actually funny because um, my husband, always, I've never gotten a film into Sundance. And my husband always says, there's a lot of people who say you got into Sundance. And he's like, it's interesting. It's almost like you have the benefit of being in Sundance with never being in Sundance. <laughs> That's funny. But yeah, so that, both Bat Kid Begins and Pick of the Litter premiered at the Slam Dance Film Festival, which is an amazing festival and I love it. And then uh, it got bought, um, it was awesome. And um, so Slam Dance, for those who don't know, happens at the same exact time as Sundance in the same exact place, uh, Park City. And Pick of the Litter was the first film that was bought that year out of either festival. So, So I remember our agents and IFC, everybody was really excited to like, have the first film go and, and also it be from Slam Dance. So that was really cool. So it, it sold within 48 hours of its premiere. And it was great and, and, and went theatrical and it was, it was just awesome. And then rumor has it, somebody told us when Disney Plus called that Bob Iger had seen the trailer. I don't, I, this is secondhand, I don't know if it's true. <laughs> he, he had seen the trailer and loved it and wanted, wanted it for their what would become Disney Plus. And whoever on the team said, look, it's already bought. And it came, it, you know, we can't have it. And he said, okay, well then have, the, have them make a series. So, which was such an amazing experience. They partnered Don and I with ABC Studios and we made uh, a six part series for Disney Plus. And it was a great, great experience. I mean, if you, you know, and, and we're actually, to be honest, we, we hope to do the same thing for, for Dear Santa to make oh, wow. a series for, you know, out of that. And I mean, when you have a story that's so much fun to tell, I mean, just the thought of being able to tell it again is, is awesome <laughs> in a different way. Oh, that's really cool. And the Pick of the Litter series is available on Disney Plus right now, right? So people can do that. Yeah, it's on Disney Plus right now. And then I think like a second window just opened for the film. And so it's on Netflix also. And it was so funny. I had a funny story the other day that um, I got a news alert about Pick of the Litter. And it was like this like best on Netflix, like top list. Like, do you ever read those? Like they're, oh, yeah. you know, and it was a top 100 films on Netflix. And so I was reading down, 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 and it started at hundred. And I was like, kept going down. I was, I was busy. I was in the middle of things. And I kept going, I'm like, why did they put, you know, I'm at like number 15, 10, five. And I'm like, why did they, why did they send this to me if it's not even on there? And then it was tied for first place with Spotlight. Really? Oh, wow. That's amazing. (laughs) So that was a crazy experience. I was like, whoa, that was nuts. So you've had you've had quite a good run with that film and then into the series as well. So it sounds like from what your plans are that we could or you could have the the same type of success with Dear Santa as well. Now, to me, it seems like your signature as a director is these heartwarming stories that really get into your emotions. Is that something you look for in your stories or is it just the magic of filmmaking coming into play? Ah, that's a good question. I think, you know, it's funny because my first three films are pretty different from my last three films. So it's almost hard to like talk about all my films in one sense, but I think I, I am looking for something. I think, you know, people always ask like, how do you choose 
the topics that you make films on. And I think like, you know, we have a lot of ideas, like ideas, like when I first met my husband, I, I had this binder I would carry around. He's like, what is that? I'm like, oh, it's my story idea folder. And he always thought it was very <laughs> funny that I had a story idea folder. And so like, you always had a lot of ideas, like clippings from things that you might read or ideas that people might tell you. And the ones that just kind of don't go away are the ones that end up happening. Like they just, you can't shake them, like, you, you know? And so I think like Witch Hunt, um, my first film about wrongful conviction, I mean, I'm so taken with the thought of wrongful conviction and, and just the thought of being like plucked out of your life and plucked out of society, losing your family, losing your kids, all this stuff. And so that is very emotional. So I think it has to have some kind of emotional component for me. And then, but when you fast forward to, to, to your Santa, which is much tonally, much happier, you know, a film, much more joyous. I mean, deep down, it has a message of like, um, it talks a lot about poverty in America with right. this glossy, fun approach to it. But I think, deep, you know, you always are getting at something. So my new way of thinking about emotions and, and how I choose what I do is I really want you to laugh, cry, and get chills mm. in my films. Like, and so maybe when I was younger and newly starting out at filmmaking, I wouldn't have had the audacity to say that, like, <laughs> that that's my goal. But like, now I would say that I have to feel like you're gonna get all three of those feelings or else it's probably not worth me taking the time to do it. Right, and you had mentioned at the beginning of the interview that, what did you say, Dear Santa was a thought that you had for about 10 years. So that's definitely something that, an example of what, one of those that really stuck with you. And are there any that you're really thinking that could become that here? I mean, you don't have to like reveal anything that, that might you might not be able to talk about, but do you have some of those those things that are kind of in that mental pipeline? Gosh, I mean, I don't think at this moment I have anything that I love like I love Dear Santa. <laughs> I was actually <laughs> wondering if I ever will love anything as much again. <laughs> um, I really, it really resonates with me for so many reasons that I, I'm not sure. But, you know, I was saying to my husband this morning, like, I have felt joy, like really, really joy. Like, okay, like, like we all know 2020 has been the worst year of all time. And so putting that aside, I've been working on this for like, you know, since like, let's say in earnest, since no like early November of last year. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I've been smiling every day since like, and it's made me so joyous that I can't think of another project that would do that. I mean, and, and everything about it, like our partners for the studio that we ended up working with, UM Studios and everybody on my crew and, and all the people who work at the USPS and, you know, just every person that we hired for this. It's just been this like joyful experience that I, I just, I'm like, ooh, the bar is pretty darn high right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure there's more stories out there, but yeah, you're right though. I mean, every, those three, you know, boxes that you want to check, those definitely came across for me in the, in the making of the movie, especially the just that fun aspect of it, which to me comes across most with the kids. And one of my favorite moments of the documentary is when the kids are talking about how they can spot the fake Santas in the malls versus the real Santa. So like, just tell me about your experience in talking with those kids and maybe expand on that example a little bit. Oh my God, yeah, that was so much fun. And that, I basically wanted it to be as authentic as possible. And so that's why I chose to, to talk to the kids. And then what occurred to me, was that like, you know, there's these like kind of parameters of the whole Christmas story and the Santa story, but then every kid kind of makes it their own. And like, it took actually in this very living room that I'm sitting in, we did while we were waiting for the letters to come in, I think it was the Saturday of Thanksgiving, I just invited every neighborhood kid over and just started peppering them with questions. So that gave me a very inexpensive way of, and that was before we did everything at home, right? Like, it was so yeah. funny. Um, <laughs> And so I started talking to the kids and, and basically saying, just trying to understand like, okay, where are these gray areas? And I thought the funny parts of it really like lived in the gray areas, like where one kid would think a little something, another kid would think a little something else. And it was really fun to, to get into their world. And I thought if, if you, especially if you start the film that, if you just say, okay, we are placing this squarely in the, the world of children and children's minds, it just gives you all this freedom to be fun with it. And so that's what we wanted to do. That's awesome. And now when they were talking about the fake Santas, I, there was something about the shoes. What was that? Yeah, oh, that was so funny. Like at least two or three kids said that they could tell like that sometimes like the, the real Santa has helpers and they're not the real Santa, but they're helper Santas. And that you could tell if, he's, if they're the real Santa or the helper Santas by the shoes. And then <laughs> uh, we showed pictures of all the Santas wearing Crocs. I was like, kids are so smart. You can't pull over <laughs> on them. 
That is hilarious. Now, when people watch Dear Santa, uh, they're going to learn about Operation Santa and they'll get to meet all of these amazing people in the stories. What is the number one thing, you did mention on this a little bit with your three boxes you want to check, but what is the number one thing you want them to feel after watching the movie? I mean, gosh, I think that's a hard question. (laughs) It's so many things. I mean, one thing I felt, uh, I, I don't want to di- dictate to anybody what they should feel. I really don't. But one thing I felt was really, you know, I think it's dissipating a little bit because things have changed in the world uh, since November. But I think I feel really patriotic when I watch it. I feel like, I, I mean, I do love America and I've always loved America. And I think that that feeling had been waning for, for a while for me. And that when I met all the people at the USPS and saw what, you know, these are people of not not major means, you know, they're not hugely wealthy people. And they spend a lot of money sometimes on others, people they don't even know. And not just a couple of them, like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of them. And that made me feel so patriotic that federal workers in America spend their time doing this, their volunteer time doing this. And I loved that feeling and I was happy to feel it again because it had been a while. So that's one thing. I mean, but that might just be me. Um, (laughs) The other thing is, you know, just hope, you know, hope of the kids, especially the kids, the kid elves and just all that stuff. Good feelings about others and coming together and all the different religions and diversity in the film that just was. I mean, we didn't know who the people were when they wrote the letters or when they answered the letters. We just followed the letters and it turned out to be a very melting pot American cast of characters. And I love that about the film. So I hope people appreciate that also. Oh, that's amazing. Now, two of the things that I got out from watching the movie, just uh, regarding the population of people in our country and the, you know, using the examples you, that you show is just the generosity and then just the gratitude as well, coming from both sides in both directions. And to me, that, in the same way that you're talking about, it kind of reestablished my faith in the country, the people, you know, what what it means to be a citizen and a community and just, you know, helping each other is really what it comes down to. And, you know, we all know this has been a pretty crazy year and we, you know, we all, uh, you know, emotions have swung all different directions. So it was nice to see something like that where it says, okay, there are a lot of good people out there and that's, that's what we want to look for and that's what we want, we want to depend on. Now, I'm sure there are going to be people who want to volunteer after watching this movie. How can people get involved with Operation Santa? Yeah, so um, so the best thing to do is to go on to the USPS's um, Operation Santa website, which is uspsoperationsanta.com. The letters are coming in every day, but there's so many volunteers and elves now that they get taken almost immediately. And there've been, last year, there was 12,000 viable letters that got adopted or a little less. So far now, I mean, last I looked, I mean, there's only, almost 20 and it's only been one wow. week today. So like, it's a massive amount of helpers, uh, elves who are coming up and letters because of the need, I think. So I would say first go on to that mm-hmm. and become an elf. I am going to save my elf giving until like the week of Christmas. And since I'm Jewish, I'm not really very busy on the 23rd, 24th. <laughs> so I'm gonna do it then because I feel like kids write late and then people kind of get too busy to, to be else. So that's my yeah. little hack for this. I would say do it, <laughs> um, do it late. And then also um, if you're just frustrated and you can't find letters, I mean, some of the people in our film that we highlighted, I mean, I think they're seeing many more donations and they'll do all the hard work. So if you just wanna to donate to Santa's Nights, K-N-I-G-H-T-S, you'll see in the film, um, um, Damien's an awesome guy and has awesome things. And there really is a Santa Claus is also uh, another nonprofit that we worked <laughs> with in this. And anybody can contact me and I can connect them with, with these people. Awesome. And I'll have links for those, all of those things on the uh, oh, podcast page and the website page. So yeah, no, thank you for expanding on that. I think uh, a lot of people are, you know, you're already saying a lot of people are on board with that. Now, where can people watch the movie right now? Sure, yeah. Anywhere you buy or rent movies, it should be there. Um, Amazon, iTunes, Voodoo, really, I think anywhere you would want to buy it, it would be ready for rental and purchase. Now, are there, I know the initial release said in select theaters as well. Are there some places where people can see it in theaters still? Yeah, there are. I don't think a lot of theaters are open, but there, yeah, there was like last night, looked like 30 different cities had them. But I know like there was supposed to be one or two here in California and they, they closed before they were open because there's new restrictions. Right. So I'm not clear of how much people can go to the theaters and maybe it's safer to stay at home. 
<laughs> yeah, that's that's what I was just going to toss out there. I'm not necessarily going to advocate people go to a theater right now, just you know the yeah. way I'm looking at things. But yeah, they can definitely rent it on, yeah. the, like you said, Amazon, Hulu, and what have you. So you no, know, yeah. I feel like Dear Santa is the perfect way for people to get into the holiday spirit. And as we talked about, we really need that right now. So thank you very much for making this documentary. But do you have any last thoughts about the movie? No, I just love it so much. I mean, it's it's really hard to like overestimate or over overstate how filled with joy it, it made me creating it. And I hope that goes out of it and you can see that when you watch it. And I really appreciate you having me on and spreading the good word. I think it showcases America in a great light. I do. Excellent. Thank you very much. Well, Dana, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. It was a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Good luck with the film and happy holidays. Thank you. You too. Once again, Dear Santa is now available to watch in select theaters and on demand. Go to dearsanta.movie to learn about the film and to see how and where you can watch it today. This is the 206 podcast where we talk about movies with the people who make them. Please subscribe, leave a review, and share on social media. Any way you can support the podcast is very much appreciated. You can find podcast episodes and all my movie reviews on 206.com. Thank you for listening. This is Mark Morin on the 206 Podcast.